Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm Carol Oldham. I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Climate Action Network. And joining me today, we have Josh Kraft from the Environmental League of Massachusetts. Hello. Emily Rochon from Boston Community Capital. And Drew Grande from the Sierra Club. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. So we're here to talk about clean energy and climate change and um, where we are in Massachusetts as a state and where we want to go and how we can get there. So um, I just wanted to see if folks wanted to set the, um, set the context in terms of why clean energy matters and why, why it's a good idea. Great. Uh, well, I can take a start at that. I think, um, you know, as a lot of us know, there are a lot of reasons why renewable energy is better than dirty energy. You know, fossil fuels have a lot of externalities like pollution and create asthma and lots of harm in, in mining communities. And, you know, clean energy basically avoids a lot of those things. Um, solar, for example, is a zero emission source of energy. Put it on your rooftop, you put it in a field, you plug it in, and the power it produces is emission free. And so, um, you know, it's definitely a preferable alternative to a lot of the energy sources we're relying on today. And, and in addition to the public health benefits, I think you know, there's a range of climate change benefits and maybe some other benefits that Drew or Josh would like to highlight. Yeah, and uh, I think Emily provides a great context for the, the environmental benefits. But in New England, where in Massachusetts, we're in a region that doesn't have indigenous sources of fossil fuels mm -hmm. or supplies that we can rely upon. And over the last decade or so, we've done a really good job of shifting away from relying on out-of-state, large-scale fossil fuel resources and shifting that um, with uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act and the Green Communities Act to relying on efficiency and then more local renewable energy resources. Um, there was a study that was done recently that about we spend about $22 billion a year on mm. energy expenditures. and. 80% of that flows out of state, and we're doing a pretty good job of reversing that, but we need to continue that momentum, bef particularly before we import new sources of energy from out of this region. The, the $22 billion in, in energy, it's important to remember that's just the energy cost right there from the former sources that we've been getting our energy from, our electric, electricity from. Uh, three years, four years ago, we had three active coal plants in the state, Salem Harbor, Brayton Point, and Mount Tom out in Holyoke. Uh, working with families in Holyoke the last several years with organizations like Neighbor to Neighbor, New Oasis Oasis, Toxic Action, Action Center, we've had a lot of interaction with, with the residents and families that live out there. And oftentimes, the first thing when we start talking with someone is uh, they, they move to Holyoke from Puerto Rico. They were healthy. They'd been living there for a couple weeks. They started getting a nagging cough. They wanted to see what it was. They thought maybe it was allergies. They go to the doctor. They're diagnosed with asthma. And that right there gives them an extra financial burden that they're now stuck with. Uh, we've talked with numerous families that several children have asthma. They're uh, on asthma medication that runs $100 a month per child, per family. And that goes every month, and that's on top of the hospitalizations, the asthma attacks, the missed school, the missed work, mm -hmm. which just builds into this, into this cycle of extra costs and sending them farther back and uh, making it harder for them to advance. And of course, one of the reasons that the Massachusetts Climate Action Network cares about clean energy is that broader context of you know, climate change is the largest threat that humanity is facing right now, and actually wildlife as well. And, um, and the only way that we're going to tackle is it, it, it is that is to move towards cleaner sources and to move away from these dirty old polluting fossil fuels. So yeah, um, we're 100 percent on board with that. Right, and I think the direction that we need to head in in Massachusetts that's you know clear from both a, a, a science of climate change perspective, but also from the economic development perspective, is 100 percent renewables by 2050. That's really the only way you get to the emission reduction levels that are needed to avoid catastrophic climate change. Um, but the good news is, of course, there's a whole host of other economic jobs, healthy community benefits associated with that transition. And so the money that we will be spending is going to do much more than protect the climate, but also make sure that everybody in Massachusetts has a healthier future. Absolutely. And I think um, I've seen, I've seen um, really interesting infographics about how we can get to 100% by 2050. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that that was incredibly compelling because it feels 
uh, very difficult. It feels very far away. It feels like, you know, we don't have that much sun. We don't have, you know, that many, like you were saying, native energy resources here. But to look at this sort of breakdown in terms of, I think it was 22% solar right. and, um, you know, a big chunk of offshore wind, um, I think it's like 50% or, or a little bit over 50%, um, it starts to, to become a reality and you start thinking about, okay, well then, if that's the picture, then how do we get from where we are to where we need to be? Right. And um, so let's talk about actually where we are right now. So um, we've got... We have obviously a lot more renewable energy happening in the state than we did um, even just a few years ago. Yeah. Things are cranking along. We've got how many thousands of, of solar and wind jobs that are already happening here in Massachusetts? We have 12,000 solar jobs in Massachusetts, making us the second largest solar employer in the nation, wow. only behind California. And we're top in the nation for energy efficiency and have been for several years. That's right. And um, it's really exciting that under our energy efficiency programs, we managed to not only um, stop growing the amount of electricity we use while our economy grows, but we've managed to start seeing that load of electricity start to go down. And we think even though um, Massachusetts is a leader, we should keep in mind that this is, we're sort of at the horizon, that there's still a lot way, a way to go to reduce the amount of energy waste that we have right. and reducing our emissions. It's just, it's, we're only scratching the surface. Right, um, and particularly with energy efficiency be because so many of our buildings are older and right. so many of our industries are older and so we have a lot that we can still do. Yeah, and again, the, um, the right now, I think folks in the, who are involved in NCAM should know that there's a three-year energy efficiency plan mm. that's on the table um, that utilities run in many of our communities across the state. And um, to date, we haven't seen any negative rate impacts from the fact that we've invested heavily in efficiency and we just need to keep hammering on that nail and keep reducing the amount of load that we, we use. Um, and we're seeing a little bit of backsliding there. And so we, right. we, you know, we, it's very important to keep an eye on that and ensure that our electric distribution companies know that you all in your community support the kind of investments in efficiency and in solar that Emily's been talking about. And by electric distribution companies, we're, we're talking about the utilities, utilities. right? Utilities, okay. that's right. Just that's making right. sure. Both electric and gas. Yep. And yep. Josh, I've heard that for every dollar Massachusetts spend on energy efficiency, we get at least $3 worth of savings. Is that true? Yes, and uh, I've heard actually upwards of $5 in benefits wow. for every, if you look at both the economic benefits, which are more in the three dollar range, but okay. then also the public health mm. and climate benefits that are related. So again, up six years into the programs, we're still seeing lots of room to improve on that energy waste and, and reach more homes, more businesses. Um, and again, I, I think it's wonderful that it's something that um, people can do in their homes and their communities. You can take that effort and um, if you, even if you've had an energy audit or had some work done and keep doing that, but also remind your state officials that there's a, a commitment to make sure that structure remains in place, that you, know, you have that opportunity rather than relying on another set of large power plants that are not in your community and probably you know, overall have, you know, it's not gonna be clean energy. It's not gonna yeah. be the stuff that gets us to our, our, uh, our goals in terms of climate. Yeah. Yeah. And Drew, you've been working a lot on offshore wind. Um, so, so where are we Very exciting. in terms of that? Offshore wind yeah. uh, just announced uh, two weeks ago now, we've seen the uh, groundbreaking on offshore wind, more of a construction kickoff, I should say, with, with, when we're talking about building out in the water. Mm -hmm. But uh, deep water wind is starting the construction phase of the Block Island Wind Farm Project, which is a 30 megawatt five turbine projects uh, three miles off the coast of Block Island, which is just off, uh, just off of Rhode Island. Block Island's about 12 miles out to sea, so three miles beyond that. It, they are uh, huge machines that are gonna be out there in the ocean that can be supplying energy to Block Island, uh, which right now receives all their energy from diesel generators on the island. Oh. They burn a million gallons of diesel each wow. year. Uh, those, those diesel generators get the diesel by putting tankers onto ferries that go out into uh, Block Island Sound, supply the, supply the island with, with diesel generators. And if you're ever out on the island uh, and you find where they are, they're not too hard because they are incredibly loud generators. Oh. They sound like, uh, sound like a, a field of, of Mack trucks just rumbling away. <laughs> they're not quiet machines by any means, and they're also not clean by any means either. So there is a, there is a haze. You're out in the middle of the ocean, and there's a haze problem out there. 
So uh, we're going to immediately see uh, air cleaning up in Block Island. We're going to see the electric rates in Block Island decrease by 40%. So right now, Block Island residents pay about 55 cents a kilowatt hour. There'll be a 40% decrease in energy. Uh, and they're also going to be, for the first time, Block Island is going to be connected to the rest of America through an undersea cable. So mm -hmm. the excess energy from those wind turbines will pass from Block Island back to Rhode Island, and uh, Rhode Island is going to be, all of Rhode Island is going to be able to have, have the benefit of offshore wind. That's great. And on the economic side, we're looking at, with this Block Island wind farm project, the creation of 300 new jobs, so those mm -hmm. 300 new clean energy jobs that will not be able to be shipped out overseas or outsourced to, uh, to some, someplace else. And I know we had hoped originally that those would be in Massachusetts and that we would have, you know, that we would be sort of the first in the nation to be able to have those turbines heading into the water. But it looks like Rhode Island's going to beat us, so yep. we can be Rhode close behind. <laughs> Rhode Island's going to win. So the yep. construction phase is this, this summer in July. The uh, foundations are going in the water, so that'll take place from July up till September. And then same time frame next year, the actual turbines will be going in, uh, oh. and then fall of 2016 is when the when they will turn those turn those on and start supplying power. Uh, now you talk about Massachusetts offshore wind. There's still the potential out there, so Massachusetts yes. won't be first, but there's still a lot of potential out there. 9,000 megawatts of clean offshore wind power are out there, ready for Massachusetts and the rest of New England to take advantage of. And yeah. is that in those offshore wind leases that the federal government is exactly, putting right. together? Yep, those are, the, those are the first offshore wind leases. Uh, Deepwater Wind has one of those leases, the, the same people who are m building the, the Block Island project. Offshore MW is working with Martha's Vineyard on, a, on another mm. one. They're, they're going to have a small piece of that one. And Dong Energy is a holder of the third lease. They're da a Danish company, right? Yep, Danish yeah. company. Okay. Great. So we have one of the largest offshore wind developers in the world interested and ready to take advantage of the Massachusetts offshore wind market mm. and, and um, you know, a tremendous opportunity with that to develop an industry here. Yeah. But again, 10 times at least the size of what was available at Cape Wind, much further offshore. Yeah. And without those visibility problems. Without those visibility problems. Yeah. And, yeah. and again, uh, you know, again, part of seeing the opportunities that we have, we have a lot of energy dirty energy that's about to retire yeah. and come offline. And of course, there's a lot of hesitation and concern about how we're going to meet our needs reliably. But we have resources here um, in whether it's offshore wind, whether it's our solar resources, and then whether there's a lot of um, at least 3,000 megawatts and probably more in, up, in upper New England that with the right mixture of policies we could we could bring here. And so I think as we consider how we keep New England thriving and deal with the fact that we have a lot of turnover in our generation fleet, that we have this great opportunity. Again, good for the climate, good for our economy, and good for our, our air. And Josh, I keep thinking back to that $22 billion number that you put out there earlier. That's $22 billion that we can reinvest back into New England. That's right. Well, along those lines, solar in Massachusetts between 2010 and 2014 resulted in $2.37 billion of investment in the state. Right. And so our energy dollars are definitely staying here more when you're investing in renewables. And on the solar front, you know, the, the industry is booming um, to some extent. I think maybe we'll talk a little bit later what's going on um, slowing down solar. But we have 841 megawatts of solar in Massachusetts. It's enough to power 128,000 homes, and it's about 2% of our electricity. We're doing an excellent job. We've got the fourth most installed solar capacity in the nation, oh, wow. um, which is pretty significant given we're not, you know, a sunny California or Arizona. But to give us some perspective, I think it's important to look, you know, to our European neighbors and see where they're at. Belgium, for example, it's about the same size as Massachusetts, same number of people. They get less sun than us, but they have five gigawatts of solar. Wow. So they have more than five times as much solar as Massachusetts. So we can definitely be doing more than we're doing now. And can you tell us, I know that the, that the company that you work for does a lot of solar sure. financing. Can you tell us about some of the interesting projects that yeah. you've seen while you've been working there? Absolutely. So I work for Boston Community Capital. They're a community development finance institution. It's been around for about 30 years now. Um, they manage over a billion dollars worth of assets, which is pretty incredible. Um, but their mission is to build healthy communities where low-income people live and work. And one way they do that is by developing solar projects in affordable housing settings to make sure that prices are stabilized and that you know 
uh, budgets, operating budgets, are, are not in jeopardy because electricity prices double over the winter or something like that. Solar is a great solution for those sorts of things. And so we do projects all over Massachusetts. We have about four megawatts in total, um, but you know, which is now less than half a percent of what's in the state. But for example, we have solar panels on the roof of the Greater Boston Food Bank. You can't see them if you're driving by on the highway N93, but they're all there. We've uh, basically plastered their roof with as much solar as we can get up there. Um, and it's saving the organization you know, about $20,000 a year. And every dollar the organization saves uh, I think it's about 2.36 meals extra that they can provide to the mm. communities in need. For every dollar. Yeah, for every dollar wow. saved. Um, and similarly, you know, we have um, a community solar project in Gardner, Massachusetts that we built along with the Gardner Redevelopment Authority and Mayor uh, Mark Hawk out there. It was a great supporter. And we are sharing the net metering credits generated by that project with four local organizations, including an affordable housing development and um, a, a, an organization that works with the disabled community that otherwise couldn't put solar on their roof. And again, you know, we're saving them at least $10,000 a year. So solar is a huge solution for low-income communities. And we're out there in the market trying to develop those kinds of projects to, to demonstrate that you know, solar benefits everybody, even if it's not on your rooftop. But particularly if, if you're able to access solar directly, then you know, you're going to get a whole host of benefits. Right. And I know I was, um, so the way that MCAN is structured for the, for the audience out there, um, we have town, town level um, chapters. And, um, and I was at the Sustainable Winchester meeting, that's one of our chapters, and um, they have, they're putting solar on their schools. And they did a back of the envelope calculation during the meeting and figured it's gonna save their schools something like a half a million dollars um, yeah. in the short run. So it's, it does save an awful lot of money. And I think you yeah. told me a story about Greenfield um, being able to actually not have to raise their taxes yeah. because they were, because yeah. they had a solar exactly. project. Exactly, I mean, that, and that's not a BCC project, but that's the, one of the many benefits of solar is because it stabilizes and fixes your energy costs, you know, cities and towns are able to plan more effectively and efficiently and instead of having to raise property taxes, in some instances they can lower them or school budgets are more stable. So, you know, kids can get an after school music program where otherwise they may have had to cut it. That's the benefit of renewable energy and solar because it's, you know, smaller than wind, really a distributed energy resource. You can put it almost anywhere and whoever is near the project is basically benefiting from the savings. And so um, it, it's a real game changer because um, in addition to the savings and its ability to keep the lights on, solar, for example, paired with an air source heat pump can keep you warm during the winter. So you're not burning natural gas, you're not relying on oil or something else. And right now, you know, that's the most cost effective solution in a new build residential setting. Uh, solar and air source heat pumps. So it's it's like a win for the climate and a win for your pocketbook. It really doesn't get much better than that. And there is actually quite a quite a few megawatts of wind in the state, right? That's not offshore. That's yep. actually onshore. Just under 200 megawatts of wind uh, across Massachusetts right now. And we have even Josh was alluding to. We have even more potential for that in northern Maine, where we're trying to get some of that down here. There's a demand for that uh, through. Uh, communities that are looking for more wind energy to, to bring down to their to their residents and, and businesses. That's great. That's great. Um, so let me just ask um, you folks to set the set the um, I guess to to explain the setting in terms of how we got where we are. Um, I know that there there are a couple pieces of legislation that got us sort of moving on clean energy as a state. And Josh, if you want to just tell us a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah. So. Uh, Massachusetts, again, when we were at a period not unlike today when we were experiencing high natural mm -hmm. gas prices and greater and greater concern about the impact that we knew that we still know that climate's going to have, climate change is going to have in our communities, um, we enacted the Green Communities Act uh, and along with the Global Warming Solutions Act. But the Green Communities Act was really a requirement that we change our model um, in terms of how we purchase and prioritize investments in power. And mm. so the first thing we, we need to do is um, it calls on our utilities to invest in all energy efficiency resources that are cost effective or cheaper than new supplies. And again, energy efficiency, it's not just a personal virtue, it's a resource that we can rely on and we've been relying on it for quite some time. Um, that, uh, the Green Communities Act set the stage for um, both the solar incentive programs, and, uh, the SREX program and at metering, 
which made people producers and of their own power, which and gave you that and of option. their neighbors' power and of their right. neighbors' power, so you could share that power. And then it, it also re, um, was the first time that uh, our, our renewable portfolio standards, so that we mm. were required to get 15 percent of our power from um, Class One renewable energy sources. Sorry for the jargon. Just the really good stuff. The, the good stuff. stuff. The stuff that yeah. we're really yeah. 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 um, talking about here. And, uh, yeah. and by, tw by 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, the great news is, again, that we've, we've seen um, emissions drop. Um, yeah. And we've seen, um, you know, I think it's by like 11% since 1990. And while right. our economy continues to boom. Yeah. But uh, we have a lot more that we can continue to do and sort of build on that foundation. Uh, and we're going to need to do that. Um, if we're going to honor our climate commitments uh, in any real way over the next decade. Right. And Drew, I know that the Renewable Portfolio Standard is something that's really important to the Sierra Club. Do you want to tell us a little bit about where you guys would like to go with that? Sure. So the Renewable Portfolio Standard, just like Josh said, it uh, tells the utilities that they need to start increasing the amount of clean renewable energy they get each year, that they, they build into their mix. So whether that's solar or wind or if they get geothermal from somewhere, that's, that's all part of it. So right now, the, the renewable portfolio standard is set to increase by 1% each year. And that's been in place since 1997. And the great part about this is, is that we've been able to do that. We haven't had any glitches or road bumps in the way with the utilities said, oh, there's no way we can, we can, we can do this. They've been able to, to, to do that. So what we want to do is in order to start, once now that we're on that verge of bringing in the wind from, from northern New England start building out the offshore wind. We've seen solar energy really taking off and is continuing to grow. We want to make sure that's happening because it goes back to that $22 billion of energy dollars that are leaving the state. So in order to capture that and bring it back in, we want to see the renewable portfolio standard increase from 1% each year to at least 2% each year so that we can really start taking advantage of all the pieces that are out there. Uh, we've been as a community, as an environmental community, we, we've been saying for a long time, we can't be over-reliant on any one energy source. And whether that's coal, nuclear, uh, natural gas, as we've started to move away from some of those and start trying to invest in some of these other things, we want to make sure we're not getting over-reliant in any one source, whether that's solar, offshore wind, or wind. We want to start seeing a mix of those. And that's what the renewable portfolio standards can allow us to do that, is make sure that we bring all of those forward to make sure that all of Massachusetts has the opportunity to take advantage of those. So while we're on the sort of um, policy focus, um, can you tell us a little bit, Emily, about the, about the and actually Josh, you as well, about the, um, I know that solar, that the, we're sort of reaching this point where things are stalling out a little bit because um, there's not the same commitment to some of the progressive policies that there have been in the past. Yeah, solar's hit a pretty big roadblock in Massachusetts, um, and it's quite problematic. Uh, in Massachusetts, we have net metering, which basically is a, an accounting mechanism that allows you to get credit on your bill for any electricity that you export into the grid. Um, and it's a very important- So if your solar is making too much too much electricity, then you can put some of it back in the grid and get, and, and it basically winds your, your bill back. Yeah, it's like rollover minutes on your cell phone plan. And so in that way, even if you're not home during the day, you can use the credits at night. And it's a, a very a critically important mechanism to get new solar um, installations built. 43 states have net metering in some form or another. Massachusetts is not unique. What we are unique in is that we limit how much um, solar can net meter by what's called a cap, and that's set through statute. And the cap um, has been hit in, in national grid territory. So that means if you're a customer of national grid and you're looking to build uh, a solar system, you are not eligible for net metering now. It's important to realize that this doesn't apply to smaller residential systems. So if you're a homeowner, you know, that's not a problem. But a lot of the low income solar projects, community shared solar projects, municipal projects, those are stalled out unless the legislature raises net metering caps. Emily, yes. there must be some very important technical engineering reason why there's a cap in place. <laughs> no, actually there isn't. It's, it's, there really is no reason to cap net metering. 
metering, you know, that if the technical issues are dealt with another part of the solar process, you know, called interconnection, that's, that's handled. The engineers come in, they figure out if it's safe, if the, an upgrade is needed, that's all taken care of. So there's no reason to, to cap net metering. And right now, because the cap has been hit in national grid territory, 171 communities, or basically 49% of the state, has less access to solar. Um, and even if you don't care so much about that, there are people losing their jobs, which is quite problematic. Um, you know, there's a real human cost to this sort of start, start and stop policy of solar here in Massachusetts. So we're asking the legislature to act immediately to raise net metering caps, you know, this year before the, they go on their summer recess. Um, there's no reason to stop solar from working for Massachusetts um, over net metering cap issues. Are and you then, telling me that people are losing their jobs over completely arbitrary policy? <laughs> yes, true. I know that's hard <laughs> to believe. Um, but yeah, there are people like the utilities and others that don't view solar favorably. And so if people lose their jobs as a consequence, they really don't care that much. Um, they can still sleep at night. And Fascinating. Yeah, well, c'est la vie. I think you know, it's one of the ways in which anti-renewable energy forces are, are leveraging policy to slow the success that we've experienced to date. And Massachusetts has been a leader on this and so many other clean energy issues. We really need the legislature to make sure we retain that leadership and that the people that have these solar jobs can keep them. Yeah, and I, and I would add that the, the cap on uh, net metered solar, community solar at your homes, was, was an experiment because we had no idea at the time how popular people generating their own power, a zero emission, zero cost fuel would be. And now we have, what is it, 800 meg megawatts of solar, you yeah. know, come online in a very rapid order of time. Yeah. I mean, that's- Because everybody loves that's, it. That's it real power, <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. and so, you know, the, the, the trick for the legislature and, and for the governor is to keep this momentum going, you know, and there may be some adjustments to the policy structure we have that we can make, but, you know, this is, this is a success story. This yeah. is not right. a- the, Let's the, not get in the way of yeah, it. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. 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 Um, so actually, I'd like to just talk a little bit about what folks can do, both in, on their household level and then also on the community level, um, to make sure that they're supporting clean energy as much as they possibly can. So who's got some thoughts about that? Well, I'll, I'll just start just saying, really, take, you need to take advantage of the energy efficiency programs yeah. if you haven't. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether it's... Um, taking advantage of the fact that you can put LED lighting, high quality, mm. very low energy lighting in your home through our energy efficiency programs, whether you have a big utility or you have a municipal utility, you have programs available to you that you can call and come to your house. Um, and then while you're at it, think about doing a larger job, doing some work to seal up your home, um, air sealing, insulation, and then as Emily said, an air source heat pump. It can really add up and they're really generous incentives and, and, a, and a heat loan program which provides really zero cost financing um, and you know particularly for thinking about solar in you know or in your community and if you're not if you're a renter you can take advantage of the programs you know do it now yeah and community shared solar is a great way for renters to to get absolutely. engaged absolutely. with those projects and if you've had an audit <laughs> Go ahead and get the work done. Get the work done. Because there's there have been an Bring awful lot of people who've had audits who have not actually then taken that next step and and gotten their you know their house weatherized and and all of that kind of thing. I get it. We did the audit. Yeah. Uh, did the audit. Followed up on it. Yeah. Did the caulking. Did the insulation. The next winter, use one tank less of oil. Wow. It it's makes a difference. It's a huge difference. Yeah, we yeah. had our house insulated through MassSave, and it cut yeah. our energy bills in half. Well, and particularly after this winter, I mean, I, just walking around neighborhoods noticing all the ice dams, yes. I was definitely thinking, man, there are a lot of people who are spending a lot of money and staying up at night. It was surprising um, to see how many ice dams yeah, there were. Yeah, it was horrifying. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time, and uh, we'll continue the conversation next time. Always a pleasure, Carol. It's a pleasure, Carol. <laughs> Thanks, thank Carol.